Sorry, good evening, everybody, if you would like to sit down. Thank you. I would like to welcome you all to the 25th of October 2023 Full Council. Can I ask members, when speaking directly into the microphone, this will enable members and members of the public to hear you. Can I remind members to place their mobile phones to silent and to stand when possible when speaking? Can I remind members to remain seated at the end of the meeting until I have risen to conclude the meeting? Can I also remind those members who wish to speak this evening to keep their hands up until acknowledged by the chief exec? Because sometimes you just go like that, put them down, and uh, we don't always see you. So if you could remember that, thank you. To remind members that the meeting is being live streamed and I welcome the members of the public in the gallery watching and listening to the council meeting tonight. I would like to remind all members of the council's adopted code of conduct for councillors, which you agreed to and are expected to adhere. At recent council meetings, the behavior in the chamber has been unacceptable. And some members, and before I progress this evening's meeting, may I take this opportunity to remind members that I will not tolerate inappropriate behaviour or discourtesy in this chamber. <laughs> members should be respectful of each other and behave properly in conducting the council's business. If a member continues to disagree with my ruling on matters and cause a disturbance or behave improperly, I will, as chair, request the member to be removed from the meeting. I would now like to ask the Reverend Darren Barlow to lead us in prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Over the past 24 hours, we've seen numerous reports from the United Nations regarding the ongoing tensions in Israel and Gaza. It was 78 years yesterday, the 24th of October 1945, that the United Nations Charter came into force. This happened after the document was ratified by the five permanent members of the Security Council, China, France, the USSR, now the Russian Federation, the United Kingdom and the United States, and a majority of the other signatories shortly after the end of the Second World War. Today, 193 countries are members of the UN, as a charter, it is a constitute, constituent treaty and all members are bound by its articles. Furthermore, the charter states that obligations to the United Nations prevail over all other treaty obligations and most countries in the world have now ratified the charter. As one might expect, the charter is lo a long and complicated document, but I'd like, like to briefly read some words from the preamble. We, the peoples of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to humankind, and to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women, and of nations large and small, and to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from these treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained, and to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. And for these ends, to practice tolerance and live together in peace with one another as good neighbours. As it will be apparent to everyone, the current situation in Israel and Gaza is both very complicated and very serious, and the ongoing good works of the UN are very much needed. And it is these same values and aspirations that uphold the UN that should guide us as the people of Thurrock. As the full council meeting begins this evening, 
we commit to focus and strive for the greater good of all people, putting aside any personal favour, ambition or reward. So a short prayer. We thank you, O God, for the work of the United Nations, for all that has been achieved over these past 78 years since the Charter came into force. And this evening, we lift before you the situation in Gaza and Israel and pray that a peaceful way forward could be, could be found. We particularly pray for the innocent civilians, both Palestinians and Israelis, who are in the midst of real danger this night. Keep them safe, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. Um, apologies for absence. I've received apologies from councillors Gary Byrne, councillor Gary Collins, councillor Mor Val Morris Cook, and councillor Neil Spate. Are there any other apologies from absence? No? Thank you. Item two, minutes. I move that the minutes of the, extra of the meeting of the 14th of September 2023 Extraordinary Council on pages 11 to 14 be approved as a correct record. Is this seconded? Thank you, Councillor Jeffries. Is any member in disagreement with the accuracy of the minutes? Thank you. Oh, Councillor Raper. Yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm not sure to whom this question is, is um, addressed, but I just wanted to know, can someone explain why the portfolio holders' responses uh, to questions from the public and questions from councillors is not included in full in the main body of the uh, minutes? Thank you. Thank you. I'm taking advice. Councillor, um, I've been told that they will come back to you with an explanation as to why this is. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Worrell. Thank you. And it, and it may be of the same, um, but just while you are looking at that, um, I'd just like to point out that on page 22, I too asked a question, and it just as um, what I asked the question on, but it was the supplementaries that are just as important as the questions. And I asked a question on the right to buy. And um, Councillor Johnson was going to provide me with a response to that. And I understand that unless you see it and you read the minutes, it will prompt you to make sure that that councillor gets their response. So I do think that there is some reason why we should revert back to having the questions minuted and what were the secondaries were because it does you know when you're looking back prompt people to the stuff that is important and in doing so could that's just a prompt for me to tell councillor johnson he hasn't given me my response thank you thank you look councillor worrell um yeah i probably i think i agree with you we should now include all the things i'm sorry but as to be fair and open on everything, I think that is an important point. I know I'm getting the look of death, but I think it is an important point. Can any member like to second these minutes, so? Councillor Jeffries, thank you. I will now move that the minutes of the meeting of the 27th of September 223 of the council on page 15 to 24 are approved as a correct record. Is, there, is that seconded and is any member in, dis, in disagreement with the accuracy of the minutes? So who's going to second it? Thank you, leader. Items of urgent business. I've not agreed to any items of urgent business. Declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest to be made? No? Thank you. Announcements on behalf of the Mayor and the Leader of the Council. 
Before I invite the leader of the council to speak, I would like to take a few minutes to remember Thurrock's fallen of World War II as set out on page seven of your agenda. Rowlands, Thomas, King, Peter, Potts, Charles, Clark, Albert, Wiley, George, Rumble, George, Chalice, John. I will now invite the leader to make his announcements. Thank you, leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this month, I had the pleasure to accompany you on visits to both DP World and Thames Enterprise Park to see for ourselves the opportunities for economic growth and job creation that there is in both of these sites. I'm also pleased to report that since the start of April, we have cleared 1,422 fly tips, we've filled over 2,200 potholes, and our street cleaning team, which you'll be pleased to know are now using the barrows again, have cleared over 1,000 tonnes of litter from our streets. I'd just like to add uh, one further thing, Madam Mayor, if I can, and that is that a number of members brought to my attention that a petition had been submitted by one of our residents concerning a public inquiry into the financial collapse of the council. This was rejected because Councillor Burns had already submitted a similar petition. The petitioner was offered the opportunity for the two petitions to be combine, combined. However, they didn't wish to go down that, that route. So therefore, I have agreed for this petition to be brought to the next cabinet, where the lead petitioner will have the opportunity to speak and present their petition. I'd like to thank members for bringing this to my attention so that this very important issue can be discussed. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Leader. I'd also just like to add, I've been out and about quite a lot, but Councillor Muldoni and myself went to all three of Hub's opening for the Children's Centre. And I think it's fair to say, Councillor, we thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. And uh, the CEO, Chairman, uh, Dr. Dave Smith, also joined us for one of those. But um, we really enjoyed them, and they were excellent. And I think all the children, all the parents there, it was great to see so many using the place at the same time. So thank you, and thank you for coming with me. Questions for the members of the public. There are no public questions this evening. One question was received. This was refused as the question was substantially the same as questions raised at the September council meeting. Thank you. Uh, item seven, petitions from members of the public and councillors. Please be advised that in accordance with the councillors petition scheme, no notices of petitions have been received. <coughs> One petition was received. This was refused as substantially the same as a petition presented in September Council meeting. This petition will now be heard at the 8th of November Cabinet meeting. Thank you. Update report in respect of those petitions presented at Council and the Council Officers, item 7. This report can be found on pages 27 to 28 of the agenda and is information on the status of petitions handed in at the council meetings and the council offices. Item nine, appointments to committees and outside bodies, statutory and other panels. Leader, do you wish to make any changes to the appointments previously made? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to remove Councillors Carter and Councillor Tandy as planning substitutes and replace, them, replace it with Councillor Anderson and Essex Pensions to nominate Councillor Redsill. Thank you, Leader. Councillor Kent, is there something you'd like to add? Thank you. Madam Mayor, I'd like to nominate Councillor Raper as Vice Chair of the Standards and Audit Committee and to appoint Councillor Cappy Kent as a substitute member of that committee. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Noted. Does any independent member wish to make any changes to their appointments? Thank you. Is any member in disagreement with any of the nominations that have been made tonight? No. Sorry, Councillor Worrell. 
Thank you. Uh, employment matter. This is item 10, Assistant Director of Finance. Councillor Snell, would you please introduce the report that can be found on pages 29 to 37. You have five minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and I don't think I'll be taking five minutes. Um, this is uh, regarding uh, permission to employ an additional uh, Assistant Director of Finance. This has been through General Services Committee as part of the restructure of the organisation of the Council. Um, it's been agreed with by the General Services and it's come to Council here tonight for us to, to note that and hopefully give its approval. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Snell. Councillor Kent, do you wish to speak? You have four minutes to speak on this item. Thank you. Only, only to say, Madam Mayor, that we are in support of this uh, item and of the recommendations therein. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Would any other member like to speak on this report? No, thank you. Councillor Snell, do you wish to sum up? You have two minutes to speak. <coughs> no, I think uh, we'll take it as read, by the way. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Snell. I will now proceed to the recommendation. Full Council are asked to note the decision made by the General Services Committee on October, October the 10th, 2023, for the addition of any Assistant Directors post within the revised structure of the Finance Department. Are we all in agreement? Thank you, members. Item 11, Improvement and Recovery Plan Report. Leader, would you please introduce the report that can be found on pages 39 to 85. You have five minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm happy to present the Enhanced Recovery Plan to this chamber following the updated directions in March and the Best Value Inspection Report published in June. Since our last full council meeting, we have received a letter from the Minister of State following a letter from the Commissioner's second report on our recovery. And I'm delighted that the Minister of State has recognised that we are on the right track and we have been implementing the right decisions to get a hold of our finances. <coughs> this council is a listening council and it's my firm belief that all members want the best for the residents of Thurrock. And whilst we may have different opinions on what is best, I do believe that we want to enact positive change to our borough. As part of being a listening council, I've taken the opportunity to work across the aisle and reach out to all members to seek their voices and the voices of all our communities across Thurrock. In our member engagement sessions on our recovery plan too, I'd like to thank everyone for their involvement. Following the conclusions of our member engagement sessions and feedback from fellow members, I've now been able to recommend our improvement recovery plan to full council. This plan is not about where we have been as a council, but where we are going and appreciating the enormous potential Thurrock has. Indeed, we are in a place where we have the potential to leapfrog other local authorities when it comes to good, govern good governance and the strategic oversight of this authority. However, having said all of this, let's not be any doubt, there is still a great deal of work to be done. This is an aspirational plan that is achievable. It sets out part of our vision for the future of the borough over the coming weeks. I will, be, I will also be recommending our important plans, such as the local plan to shape the future of our borough. And I hope that we will have cross-party support for both. The future is bright for Thurrock, and although there may be some who want to talk Thurrock down, I see this report as a step on, step on the road step on the road of lifting Thurrock up and realising the ambitions of our borough. It's my hope that the whole council will also see this as an ambitious plan. Sorry. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Leader. Councillor Kent, would you like to say something on the subject? You have four minutes. Madam Mayor, I, I welcome the new improvement and recovery plan. I also welcome the approach towards creating the plan, uh, which uh, was, was more open, more encompassing, involved consultation with any member that wished to get involved. Uh, in contrast to the previous plan, which was by necessity uh, put together uh, very quickly in, in the face of, of what was uh, and, and remains uh, pretty much a, a crisis. 
I would just say that we need to remember that the audience for this plan are commissioners and government primarily. It's not a plan uh, that is aimed at the, the, the local community. And to that end, I would ask that we look to provide a kind of two-page uh, explainer uh, in simple language so that everybody knows what it is that we are seeking to, to, to achieve. I think that would be very helpful. I think there are other uh, points that I've, that I've made in, in other venues, and I'm sure that there are other men members that would like to make points, so I will stop there. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Would any other member like to speak on the subject? Councillor Worrell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for the officers that have worked so hard on pulling this together and, you know, going the extra mile to give everybody that wanted to have an input into this plan um, a fair say in doing so. Um, for me, and I understand that the, um, the audience is for this to go to the to the government rather than for the residents but something that I do feel is missing from this is a way of tracking progress um, and that there's no way of us so there's lots of stuff that the deliverables but there's no way for us to track whether we've got slippage in there or whether we're on progress and some stuff is really at a point now where we've nearly achieved it but there's no way of recording that and I say that and um, something um, an example of that is the change to the scrutiny process and that's so much work's been done on that that we're pretty much ready to have an overlap of the old the new process with the old but there's no way of measuring that we're we're nearly there mm. and but and then in contrast to that there's, we're going to have a peer review, we're going to have residency engagement, and there's no way of seeing, there's no time frames for it. So I do feel that there's a way that we should be um, recording the slippage or the progress made, um, because we are making progress, and where we are making progress, we should be able to, to say well done to ourselves and show to the residents that we are doing that, because at the moment they're not seeing a lot, you know, um, so any little win is a big win here in Thurrock. And the other thing I just wanted to, to pick up out of this, which is not in here, so it's picked up in here about member officer engagements and the progress and the plan to improve that. But we can't ignore the fact that member to member um, relationships was one of the big failures in this council yet it's not in here, and there's no way of measuring that. And there should be a way of measuring, um, because it brought us down, and we've got to make sure that we lift ourselves out of this and get ourselves on, so it should be in here as a record for progress or not making progress, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much for letting me speak on that. Thank you, Councillor Worrell. Councillor Redsell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I agree with Councillor Worrell. I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of parts in this that the ordinary lay people outside don't really understand. I know when we talk to people on the doors or we just speak to people that we're seeing as residents come to us with a problem, they just want to explain to them in a better way. And I think once it's explained to them, they seem to understand a bit more. So I think we don't. I'm grateful for all the training, whatever training we get, I'm grateful for anything. I will go... Um, to anything you know I think it's whatever knowledge we gain is much better for the council but I'll, I want to see this go forward in a in a little bit better way you know that we explain to residents what happened and although there's lots of things perhaps we can't do at the moment but I think they want there's got to be a proper outcome for people because that's what they want to see you know they want to see why and what and what happened and how it happened and so I think, we, you know, we're, we're getting towards that, but I think we could be a lot better in getting to general public. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Can th thank you, Councillors. Uh, Councillor Spillman. Hello. Um, thanks very much, uh, <coughs> Madam Mayor. Um, one of the points in the improvement plan is to build capable and effective scrutiny functions. And that was something that I don't, I don't think anyone really disagreed with. Um, I think it's cross-party agreement. 
And, and the BVI was quite clear. It, it said that members are not given the information they request, and when scrutiny make comments, these are frequently not recorded properly and not passed to decision makers. Senior officers do not sufficiently engage with scrutiny. These factors limit committee members' ability to engage meaningfully with key issues, undermining the extent to which they can provide meaningful scrutiny of council activity. As chair of PTR, I was therefore very disappointed to see that the extraordinary local plan meeting is just one day after PTR is scheduled to scrutinise the local plan. Um, I wrote last Thursday to the relevant director's department and the monitoring officer, and I, and I said, how are cabinet and officers going to have time to consider and act on my recommend, any recommendations that ONS makes? How are they going to have time to provide any further information that the committee requests? Surely this flies in the face of the criticisms made about scrutiny. To date, I have not received, this was last Thursday, as much as the holding response to that. As a result, I wrote to the, the Chief Executive today, um, he may not have seen it because it was quite late, to ask for a response to that. This document, which you know, some of us have deep concerns about, will fundamentally change Thurrock. If we are to avoid a repeat of a lot of the incidents that are and problems that are highlighted in the BVI report, then this document must be scrutinised properly. Officers and Cabinet must have time to respond to recommendations. And so I would ask the, the leader to help me and, and make sure that a proper timetable is scheduled between PTR and the extraordinary meeting to discuss the local plan. Thank you, Councillor Spillman. I think that's been noted by officers of uh, non-replies. Non Thank you. If no other members going to speak. Uh, leader, do you... Oh, hang on a minute. Sorry, Councillor Mardoni. Okay, can, can you hear me? Sorry to loom over you, Martin. Okay. <laughs> um, I would first like to acknowledge the work completed on this plan and the opportunity given to all members to input into it. This represents a small step in the right direction towards a council which is truly open, transparent and subject to appropriate democratic oversight. In the main, I agree with the Commissioner's comments that this document provides a focus on improvement through a streamlined approach and identifies outcomes which will allow progress to be tracked in, in some ways, although I do still have concerns about the granularity of the ability to track progress as it, as it current, in its current form. However, I think we should be very careful that we don't allow ourselves to fall into a self-congratulatory mode on progress made. Uh, this particularly applies to our Conservative colleagues opposite, who seem to have conveniently forgotten the responsibility they bear for turning this local authority into a financial basket case and necessitating this plan in the first place. We have heard the leader this evening claim the progress represented in this report is aspirational when in reality the progress made is mainly in preparing for how the council will function in severely reduced financial circumstances. Mm. I would like us to take a moment to reflect on the impact that progressing this improvement and recovery plan will have on our local residents. This plan does not represent improvement from our residents' point of view. In fact, quite the opposite. They are paying and will continue to pay higher taxes, fees and charges for reduced services. That's the bottom line. I don't dispute that the measures outlined to take us back to financial sustainability need to be taken. They clearly do. Paying down the debt must be a priority, as clearly it's not sustainable to keep paying 30 to 40% of the council's annual budget on servicing the 1.5 billion debt run up under the Conservatives. The real hard work of turning this council around and the difficult decisions that this will require is still ahead of us 
and the scale of those challenges should not be underestimated or played down. Although we seem to have satisfied the commissioning team, if we really want to see lasting change at Thurrock Council, we cannot allow this process to become just a tick box exercise to mm. satisfy the government. It must lead to real and lasting change at the council. Personally, I do not think this can happen effectively until we have a full independent inquiry into what went wrong and who specifically was responsible. Residents clearly want an independent inquiry. We've just heard that there are two petitions. Opposition councillors want it. The only people who don't want it are the members of the Conservative administration sitting opposite, who all voted against the Labour motion calling for such an inquiry. This doesn't seem like the actions of an administration with nothing to hide, and it does not demonstrate the shift which I would expect to see in an administration which has owned its mistakes and is committed to openness and transparency. I do believe that as all councillors need to work together to overcome this devastating situation. <laughs> and to do that, it's essential that there Excuse be a process councillors. to re-establish... Well, I'm glad you think it's funny that it the council's no. bankrupt. Yeah. Councillor, you know. Councillor Muldoney, wait a moment. I'm not going to keep having jeers from the back row, please, etc. <laughs> please let the councillors speak. Uh, but to do that, it's essential that there be a process to re-establish trust between the political groupings. Therefore, I agree with Councillor Worrell and with Councillor Redsill that then there needs to be member-member uh, -member relations need to be addressed. This was something that we included in our feedback on the plan, mm. um, and it hasn't made it through to the final plan, which is disappointing. Personally, my feeling is how can we trust the Conservatives when they're still using their majority vote to suppress further investigation into what went wrong? How can we trust members opposite who have clearly failed in their duties to hold officers to account for delivery and yet still refuse to take responsibility for that mm. failure, claiming Councillor, that they were misled by officers? Up now? Sorry, can yeah. you, can you final wind up now? Final sentence, um, Madam Mayor, thank you. That there is no part of this plan which addresses how member-member relationships and trust can be improved is the one serious oversight and flaw, in my opinion. Thank you. Leader, would you like to sum up? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I find it... I, I, I've made some notes here, and they're actually quite positive notes that I, I thought, and then Councillor Maldoni stood up and started to speak. And I'm, I'm really disappointed, because one of the things the BVI made clear was that we were constantly fighting each other. We were constantly blaming each other and criticising each other. And certainly since I've been leader, I've tried to actually, you know, offer the, the, the arm of, come on, let's work together. And I actually think we have achieved um, certainly some measure of the parties working together. It may only be a small bit, Councillor Worrell, but I'll tell you one small bit that I did do. The very first thing I did was I wanted both you and my deputy on all the committees so that you could see what was going on. So it wasn't just the two leaders, which is what I did. It's like, you don't need to respond, you're fine. You do, you Excuse do, me, Councillor Worrell. So, so I'm, I am really disappointed that Councillor Maldoni has decided to make a political speech when we're talking about the recovery of this council. It's very, very disappointing. And I'd hope that she would at least recognise that there has been some improvement between members' um, working relationship. Um, some of the other points, Councillor Kent, yeah, it's quite right that we do need to get the message out to um, the residents of the borough, and, uh, and uh, uh, that certainly has been discussed at um, um, Recovery Board and, and many meetings that I've gone to, and we do need to start getting the message out, as Councillor Redsill said um, as well, in a, in a, um, a manner that um, is easily understandable to, you know, the, man, uh, the men and women um, that live in um, um, Thurrock. Um, Councillor Worrell, you're quite right. We do need to have some sort of tracking measure to measure the progress, to make sure that we, it, we can actually see that there has been some progress. And again, you made that comment, that very comment, at a committee that I suggested you sit on. So, you know, I hope you can see that this work. Uh, so member engagement, yeah, is really important. PTR, Councillor um, uh, Spillman, happy to have a conversation with you. But... But in all honesty, I would have thought that it was more important for that local plan to come to full council so that every member 
including PTR members, can have that conversation and have an input into um, the local plan. But more than happy to have a conversation with you um, at a, um, after this meeting. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Leader. I will now proceed to the recommendation the full council approve the enhanced improvement and recovery plan at Appendix A. Do members approve of the recommendations? Thank you. Financial strategy update, item 12. Councillor Snell, would you please introduce the report that can be found on pages 87 to 121. You have five minutes to speak. Councillor Worrell, can you stop, you know, across the chamber? Oh, Councillor Worrell. Councillors, I do. Counts Councillor Worrell. Councillor Snell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this report is it's the financial strategy and it provides an update on work being undertaken to address the council's financial challenges. Uh, there is a focus on three areas, which is the financial strategy itself, divestment of previous investments and other financial management initiatives. Broadly, the financial strategy is about recovering the council's financial position and focuses on the just over a billion pound of divestments generating 150 million pounds of capital receipts to pay down debt and reducing reliance on borrowing to fund the general fund capital program. There is also ongoing work to save 18.2 million pounds from the revenue budget for each of the next two years and a further 13.65 million for each of the following three years. <coughs> and these obviously as you can imagine they are very ambitious targets and that might fluctuate over time depending upon the situation. As well as that, we've got a series of reviews looking to improve our treasury management strategy, the MRP policy, our finance structure, culture and improvement plans, and risk management, all of which should drive savings and efficiencies across the council. The divestment work stream encompasses 14 investments covering 1.035 billion pounds of original investment, of which five major ones are currently in progress and we aim to have divested of, or have underway, 93% of the Council's investment portfolio by March 2024. The recovery of the 7% balance is currently being planned. Two of the divestments are in administration, Toucan and JLG JCF, and effectively out of the Council's control. The others are, and will be actioned by the Council, with governance and monitoring place to ensure we get the best value. Litigation options on those are being explored and will be actioned where appropriate and when I can I shall bring information back on those litigation measures when it's safe to do so. With MRP accounting for around 5% on both capital investments and the capitalisation direction and with interest rates currently hovering around the 7%, we have set a hurdle rate of 12% when making decisions on which assets to divest from. Basically, if an asset is not returning 12% or more, then it should be considered for divestment. Um, and it's important to point out that you know, the council didn't have the skills or the capacity to manage these last inve large investments when it first entered into them, which is contrary to the guidance on local government investments. And it's only currently able to manage the portfolio with substantial external advice. I mean, let's be honest, the BVI here is the only game in town. We've got to divest of our investments, we've got to reduce our costs and our spending, and we've got to pay down our debt. That is the, 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 you know, the only game we've got here. Um, basically, we've got a debt of circa 680 million. We've got a financing cost, which is about 30% of our budget. Uh, these things we need to get to grips with, and we're gonna put this strategy in place now to hopefully get us through the next few years. It's a, it's a changing plan. It will change as, you know, as we go through it because things will change, figures will change as we, go, as we divest, etc. So I think I'll leave it there um, and open to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Snell. Councillor Kemp, would you like to say something? Yeah, Madam Mayor, this report makes for incredibly sober reading and it shows the stark reality of the consequences of a bankrupt Conservative Council a debt of almost one and a half billion pounds, 
meaning that 40% of our revenue budget is spent on servicing that debt. That's a position that is absolutely unsustainable. It means at least another five years of having to go cap in hand to government each year to beg for exceptional support to set a budget. An estimated £800 million of government support, uh, probably in the form of capitalisation direction, is needed, adding further to that toxic Tory debt burden. At the same time, we're looking to make £75 million worth of service cuts and to sell £150 million worth of land and property. As a result of the actions of this Tory administration, the thoroughbred of the future will look very, very different. We're, of course, looking to sell the remaining investments, a total of just over a billion pounds in 14 separate investment pots. But 75% of that is in just two investments, Toucan and the Just Loans Group. And, Madam Mayor, it's still scandalous that the Tories allowed so much borrowed money to be staked on just two bets. And the cost of recovering these investments is also spiralling. And we're now told that it's expected to be an eye-watering £56 million. And whilst much of that money can be capitalised, it will be another £10 million pressure on our general fund. And we need to be really careful to ensure that those costs don't spiral even further out of control. So I think there is little to welcome in this report. And there are elements of the 10 recommendations that, that we have before us this evening that we have real concerns about. We do, however, understand that we must make progress. So we will do the responsible thing and support this report tonight. But before we do that, can I ask the portfolio holder to clarify one thing? Recommendation 5A says, subject to recommendation 2.14, to procure and appoint the advisors using the most expeditious and efficient procurement process which is lawfully available under the Public Contract Regulation 2015, and that the financial thresholds in the Council's contract procedure rules are waived for this purpose. M Madam Mayor, when he responds, can the portfolio holder tell us what those financial thresholds are as it is important that we're all clear this evening about the level of spending that we're being asked to delegate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kent. I'm not going to ask Councillor Snell to speak at the moment. I'm going to go to Councillor Worrell, and I'm sure, Councillor Snell, you'll remember all these questions and be able to put them in your summary. Thank you. Councillor Worrell. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I agree with Councillor Kent that it's, it doesn't make good reading, but then I think that we always knew that this was never going to make good reading. But, you know, um, we are where we are from those that did what they did. So there you go. Um, so peppered amongst this report on most of the pages is a line that says that um, disposing of capital assets to generate capital receipts, currently 150 million over five years, and then it keeps saying this is under review and will be updated in subsequent reports. That kind of tells me that we're giving way to that. It's not going down, is it? We're going to sell even more and more and more of our assets and we're going to own less and less and less. You know, I, I absolutely am devastated to think what Thorrock's going to look like after this five years when we're just selling more and more and more. So I just wonder what process this will take for us in this council because we got where we was because the asset disposal list was never made available to anybody and now we've set up an investment advisory panel so that then people could then look at the asset disposals and the divestments it's been kicked down the road and kicked down the road and I brought it up at the Financial Advisory Committee. A new date was made and I'm glad that the Commissioner responsible for that committee is here. And now they've cancelled it again. Like, when is it ever going to happen? When are we ever going to know what's being sold without that meeting ever taking place? Is it going to be that people again find out what's being sold in their community? when there's a pink paper, but they're allowed to have it five days before it goes. We can't keep selling our assets from underneath our communities without there being a due process. So please, Councillor Snell, take some responsibility. Make that happen. 
Stop putting one meeting over another meeting until... And this is the one that they keep kicking down the road. And it makes me furious that we don't know and your own group don't know. And hopefully, like, somebody might even stand up and speak against it because it's absolutely appalling <laughs> that that's happening. And the second point, Madam Mayor, I want to um, raise in this um, report, and this one um, is on uh, page 113, and you don't often see the housing stuff um, make it into these reports, but there's some stark stuff in that one block of riot in there, and it's one that we as um, councillors need to keep an eye on. And it talks about there's going to be readjustments to budgets. This will involve capital projects being refocused to include essential spend removing, the aspirational discretionary spend currently within those projects. That kind of tells me there's going to be cuts to that budget. And that HRA and what we've got in our spends is going to be removed. And it won't be long before we've got going to Cabinet a report, and it will come to scrutiny, so we're going to probably be putting our rents up by 7 8% and the service charges up by 10%. And again, our, rent, our residents will be getting a lot less for a lot, lot more. And I just wondered why that was sort of in your report and it's not... I haven't seen that anywhere else. So I would hope that at the very next... Um, Councillor Worrell, will you comes, begin to sum up, thank please? You. Thank you. That's, that's all I wanted to say was, obviously, like, I was quite surprised to see that. So if... Councillor Snell could answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Worrell. Councillor Kieran. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And um, I echo all the concerns of uh, Councillor Kent and Councillor Worrell in terms of where these cuts will leave our residents. But I actually have a question related to the 18.2 million from the next two years and further cuts. Forget the impact of them. I actually don't think the administration opposite are capable of delivering these cuts, even if they wanted to. And I think that's going to become a problem for us as we go forward. And we obviously know that PwC have been drafted in on sort of an emergency contract to one until February 24 to identify the savings needed. So uh, my question really for Councillor Snow is how confident is he when... On page 90, it says that planned savings of 18.2 million. Are those savings identified? Are they firm and ready to present? Because I think this is potentially misleading in terms of making us think that the savings are already there to be rolled out. And we, we know that the very report which was um, issued to bring in PwC actually stated that this council has no culture or anything in the past that would say that it's used to identifying savings or that it's even capable of this. So when Councillor Snell um, rises, I'd be really grateful if he could um, tell us with what certainty the paragraphs on page 90, how, how certain is he that these savings could even be achieved? Thank you, Councillor Kieran. Um, Councillor... Hang on, I'll find it. Councillor Muldoney, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Snell, for this report. Um, I agree with the comments already made by my colleagues um, that this makes very sobering reading. Um, although I do welcome that we're, we're getting more of a true extent of the financial problems at the council. <coughs> Um, we need to get to that place in order to take action which will improve things. Um, the divestment of the one billion Excuse me, Councillor Muldoney, Councillor Kieran, could you turn off your mic? Thank you. <coughs> and you okay. um, due to the increased... Sorry, divestment of the billion pounds investment portfolio is obviously required under the government directions and the case for divestment is clear due to the increased costs of funding the portfolio and now that proper accounting for MRP um, has been made, obviously these investments are no longer providing a return for the council. Um, however, I've still got concerns regarding some of the governance arrangements. As Councillor Worrell has said, the investment advisory panel has not met 
um, and meetings keep being postponed, although the report states that it was due to first meeting in September 2023. Um, this follows, you know, promises in the past that we would have an investment strategy um, panel that all would be cross-party, and then that met once, I think, to, to talk about how that might go ahead, and then it, it never met again. Um, without that, there's still no cross-party democratic oversight of the divestment process um, and it continues this unhelpful pattern of decisions being made by delegated powers and members being informed after the fact given the, the findings of the bvi i think you know we need to to move forward with and this panel needs to meet uh, at the earliest opportunity perhaps the portfolio holder could address the issue of when the panel will meet in his summary I would also ask that any pink papers used to inform Cabinet, um, as it states in the report, should also be made available to Shadow Portfolio Cabinet. I'm concerned that the audit of three years of accounts from 2020 to 2021 to the present remain outstanding, and until they're finalised, there remains a risk around the full and accurate determination of the financial gap. <coughs> Perhaps also the portfolio holder could provide an answer in his summary as to when the audit of these accounts might be finalised. Um, I'd, again, I'd like to echo what Councillor Kent said about um, delegated powers. I mean, obviously the BVI um, highlighted how delegated decisions um, Im impacted and, and caused um, the debt and the financial position at the council um, and I understand that there may there is a need to act quickly sometimes in these circumstances and I understand that delegated decision-making powers can facilitate this and whilst I would hope that the commissioners are keeping a very close eye on any delegated decisions being made I'm no longer prepared to take it on faith that officers will make the best decisions once bitten, twice shy. Um, we know from the BVI report that in the past, cabinet Council, members... if you can begin to sum up. Yeah. So, again, please could uh, the portfolio holder address that issue um, and give us some assurances that there will be sufficient challenge and scrutiny of any um, delegated decisions that are made. Thank you. Hello. Councillor Red. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Worrell's already mentioned one of mine, the HRH, and I think we've both looked at that with um, open eyes, just wondering. Um, I think that, that we've still got a lot of blame culture going on. Uh, it, it's, it, we, I've said this before, we have to work together to get through this lot. It's not good reading, definitely not. But we, I'm sure that a lot of you sat on the committees as well as... I mean, I didn't sit on any of those committees, but I'm sure the other side sat on committees that they could have asked questions. I'm sure there must have been some where you sat and, and thought, was this not right? I know um, Councillor Warren and I sit and ask questions that perhaps they don't want, officers don't want. Um, it's got, Councillor Snell, two of the divestments are effectively outside the Council's control. Um, obviously, Toucan and JLG. Um, but obviously... Uh, when the administration is sold off, hopefully that money will come back to us, I hope. Um, disposing... Uh, I was surprised with 150 million in five years. I don't know why it's going to take us five years to do the investments. Um, the currently estimated at 150 of, of, of stuff we hold. Um, I'd just like to know what that is. Um, not just what we've been given at the moment. I wonder why it's going to take five years um, to sort that out. Um, I just think we've... I hate to say it again, but we have got to work together with all this because we're not going to get anywhere otherwise. We're just going to fight it backwards and forwards, and I don't know what the Labour group's going to make of it if they take control. What you know, I haven't seen anything from that side that you're going to do differently. Um, we still all have to work together to get through this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Redsill. Um, I've now got Councillor Howden, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, first of all, thank you, Councillor Snell, for your report. And 
Um, I do pay tribute to Councillor Snell and the considerable pro progress that he has made, um, supported um, by Jonathan Wilson and um, uh, Miss Woods from Essex County Council, as, um, as well as the progress that was made uh, under the previous administration, led by Mark Cockshaw and supported by Ian Wake. Um, but I'm concerned that officers, members, commissioners, and to a large extent Whitehall, are going along with what I call extend and pretend. We keep on focusing on local authorities that have declared a 114 action and questioning what can be done to rectify those individual circumstances without questioning the wider suite of circumstances that caused those events. Obviously, I'm talking about the structure of funding across local government. Unfortunately, when you talk about funding across local government, it's often a debate that is hijacked by a inaccurate conversation regarding so-called austerity. And to be quite clear, when you, to be quite clear, Councillor Kerrin, when you're Britain and you've got spending restraint to the tune of 6% of GDP, that's not austerity. Austerity is Greece having spending restraint of 25% of GDP, which causes 30% youth unemployment. The problems that we've got in Thurrock and in the UK far, far more deeply across local government are our direct funding streams. We've got council tax that is a third of a century out of date. It is mind-numbingly stupid that in this day and age of HMOs that are massively increasing population density, we are continuing with our primary route of tax based on old-fashioned council tax bandings and land bandings. It is a mad way. It is not a consumption tax. The same is true of business rates. We have the pain in local government of development and planning, creating economic growth. But we do not benefit from the proceeds of economic growth directly, because most of that uh, vanishes directly into His Majesty's Treasury. The only form, really, of direct tax that we have that is a consumption tax is the adult social care precept, which I welcome. Um, but that precept alone is an extend and pretend option. It is continuing um, to bolt new apparatus onto an, a creaking system that hasn't been properly reformed over the last 40 years. And this, this debate has largely, I think, poisoned the well when it came to the conversation regarding devolution. Now, I think devol devolution, de devolution is helpful. Um, getting more money, getting more powers into local government at a, a lower level is, of course, helpful. I don't believe what we need is local government devolution. I think what we need is local government reform. The reality is we have got too many councils in this country We've got too many councillors in this country. We've got too many directors' boards in this country. Local government has got its power distributed across too many tiers of local government in this country. I'm of the Lord Heseltine view that Britain doesn't need 300 local authorities. It probably needs 60, and I think that's still a little bit high as it is. So if I were to make a call today, the reality is because of Thurrock's economic problems, we are now in a position of prominence. Because of the imposition of directors, we have a greater line into Whitehall than most local authorities have. So if we are going to use this position where we do have such ingrained, yeah, I'm about there, where we do have such ingrained links with government, I think the way in which we need to change the narrative isn't simply around requesting more money, more direct financial assistance, which no government smiles on. It is questioning why we don't now do the hard yards reform local government funding, something no government has succeeded in doing, shrink the size of local government and return us to a more broad-based consumption tax. Fix the problem. Thank you, Councillor Howden. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, this statement, or what I'm going to find here, Councillor Snell, certainly doesn't need answering, so you don't need to make any notes. But um, the report on page 113, was it, it, it seemed to be that Council Officer Opposite said that they were surprised to see something in there about the HRA, and, <coughs> and it, it means cuts. Well, I don't know why you'll be surprised to see the mention of the HRA in this report when it's, you know, it is considered as part of this Council's budget. We're in the section 114, so I don't think it's surprising that maybe aspirational or discretionary spends, excuse me, <coughs> might be removed. But I think that those four lines in there actually 
fairly positive because it, it reads that the review will include analysis of contractual commitments, commitments currently in the program the council will honour. And the very last one on there, it says a 30-year business plan will be developed over the next three months that will ensure the HRA remains financially stable. I don't see where the negativity of that's coming into. I think that's, for the HRA, I think it's a reasonably positive response. And in all honesty, Councillor, they, those four or five paragraphs answered the question that you asked me personally, much more eloquently than I have, so I, don't, I don't know why you're surprised that it's there. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Allen, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I've got grave concern uh, 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 in terms of the assets being sold on the open market to basically the highest bidder. And I, I, I would hope that there are some members in this chamber that share my concern. Does Councillor Snell share any concern to whom our assets are to be sold to, which could of course be London boroughs seeking land acquirement for developments to house their own tenants uh, on their waiting lists to be housed uh, and acquiring our assets for that very purpose? Uh, whilst we here in Furrock are not at all addressing reducing our current housing waiting lists. So I'd appreciate if Councillor Snell could answer if he shares any concerns of whom we sell our assets, parcels of land to. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Uh, Councillor Chukwu. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just looking at that page 88, um, I just want to re-echo what um, Councillor Councillor Karen had just said, you know, looking at that 18.2 million pounds to be saved um, next year's budget, I think it's a lot of money. You know, it's a lot of money. Why 18 point something million? Not even talking about 5 million, 1 million to start with. You know, that means it's going to squeeze a lot of um, services. It's going to squeeze the people of Thorock. I think we should look into that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Spillman. I'm, I'm going to take issue um, with a, a comment made by um, the Leader of the Opposition for a second. Um, he, he makes comment that we put our eggs into two baskets. Now, I, I, if Councillor John Kent, if you can correct me, that we invested <coughs> 200, and it says here in the BVI report actually, um, 268 million in Rockfire and Toucan in December 2017. Um, that decision was made at the council's CSR committee. Um, as I understand it, that investment was signed off by both the Labour leader and Labour by, um, deputy leader at the time. Well, can Councillor Kent correct me if I'm, if I'm saying something that is incorrect? I'd be very welcome for him to challenge me if I'm wrong that Labour signed off that investment in Rockfire. Um, excuse me. Uh, Councillor Kent, would you like to reply to that? Madam Mayor, I have no idea whether that's true or not. The Labour leader and deputy leader of the time tell me that it isn't. Thank you, Councillor Kent. I will now go to Councillor Snell to sum up, and if you are aware of all the questions. Can you, can you be quiet on the other side so we can hear Councillor Snell, please? Oh, Madam Mayor, Ma Ma I'm, I'm sorry. I'm perfectly prepared to ask my councillors to be quiet. You have just allowed banging of desks no. without a word being said. Councillor Kent, Can I actually, ask all uh, Labour Councillor members Green, to be etc. Can I just say, Councillor Kent, you are wrong, because if you'd like to listen to the replay, I actually told them to stop banging. Did I or did I not? Yes. 
well, councillor, it's my meeting, I'm running it, and we're not going to keep having a circus. I'm not going to have banging, I'm not going to have chatting across the chamber. You know, this is public records. Public expect the best of their councils. Councillors, thank you. Councillor Snell, would you like to sum up? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, and to, to start with, I, I was at the meeting that Councillor Spillman uh, refers to. Um, at being at the time the leader of uh, a different group um, and I can confirm that leaders of all parties and deputy leaders were in the room and did indeed all agree for that investment to, to go ahead. Um, now I understand Councillor Kent has been told otherwise and that's fine but I can tell you I was there and I know what was said and who voted for what. So that's on record now. Um, I mean, Councillor Kent's right. I mean, this, the, the council is, is, in a, is in a terrible situation. We, we don't doubt that. Um, we've acknowledged that over and over again. The previous leader acknowledged it multiple times. The previous leader, the current leader, have apologised to the state we're in multiple times. We have acknowledged that, you know, that these issues are largely uh, of, of our own making. But we've also made very clear, and I think uh, one meeting the, the, the group opposite acknowledged the fact that actually we do all indeed have a part to play in, in A, the problems in the first place, but of course, obviously, the recovery moving forwards. Um, so, you know, it's, it is true, yeah, we, we're going to have to go to um, the government to ask for money over the next few years. Be, you know, we've got to get into the, out of the situation we find ourselves in. It's no good harking back to how we got here. The fact is, we're here. We've now got to move forward and get out of the position we're in now. Um, I think Councillor Johnson answered Councillor Worrell's point quite well. Um, you know, it's, it's, the HRA has obviously got to be part of the plan. It's obviously a substantial budget. Um, it is, as you well know, largely ring-fenced. So the idea is to look at that and see if you know, we can make the best, the best opportunities of that. Um, Excuse me, Councillor Stout, I'm actually going to give you another minute because I know you had quite a few, because you've run out of time, but we, oh, did have, yeah, we did have quite a few questions. So if you could answer the questions. I, I have two, 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 minutes, two pages, yeah. well, nearly three pages of things here. Well, um, we'll hear your answers and uh, that'll be it. Thank I think you. The, other, the other point being made, Councillor Kerry made, was uh, uh, about, I'll be, and others, I'll be confident we can make the cuts. Um, the answer to that in the short term is yes. Um, that is why we've had to bring in external help to, to do just that. Well, the, the, as I explained before, we don't have or we didn't have in the council the capacity or the knowledge to, to work out how to make these cuts in essence. Because don't forget, whilst we're, we're in the financial situation we're in, we've still got to run the council. So it's not just a case of everybody's just doing the, 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 the recovery of the, the, the finances. They've also got to run the council as well. So we needed help and we've brought that in now to help us find these cuts. It is a challenge. I'm not going to deny that. Um, and as I said uh, in my uh, piece earlier, is that you know, we're hoping to get to there. It may change. We may have to revise those figures as we go through. We hope not, but we have to wait and see. After all, this is a strategy. This is what we are hoping to achieve. We, we think we can. But of course, time will prove otherwise or, or not. We'll, we'll either get there or we won't, but we'll have to wait and see. But the strategy is there and, the, and the, everything is in place to enable us to get to that position. And hopefully it will work. We think it will, but we'll, as I say, we'll to, be, it remains to be seen. Um, the audit, it's, yeah, of the, of the accounts. It is, it's, it's late. But then, so is it late for a, a vast number of councils throughout the country. Uh, the government have acknowledged there is an issue with this. And they, as far as I'm aware, seeking a solution where we have some kind of interim assessment report put in. I don't know the full details of that yet. Uh, when I do, I should bring that to Cabinet Council. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's an issue industry-wide. And that is you know, a challenge for everybody, not just us. Uh, let's have a look. Councillor Allen, do I have concerns over asset sales? Uh, well, we, we do have to divest of our assets, that is for sure. 
Um, it, it's, it's taken five years we've put there. Well, that's obviously not everything is straightforward. You know, there's, there's land issues. There's, there's all sorts of complications which could delay some of that process. Um, but your particular worry was, am I concerned about who is buying the land? And your particular concern is uh, people from London boroughs coming, potentially um, moving into houses that could be built on that land. And I, I need to ask Madam Mayor, what, what is his problem with people coming out from London? I, I came out from London. Uh, my family came out from London. Most of the people I live with came out from London in, in my area. So I wonder, do you have a problem with that, Councillor? And if so, what is that problem? Um, Councillor Chukwu, you're talking about these cuts or these uh, savings squeezing the people of Thurrock. It's not squeezing the people of Thurrock, it, you know, I'll, I'll use your word, it's squeezing the, the, the officers in the council. They, they're the ones that have got to make the savings. The services, we will, we will continue to provide services, but it is a fact that the directorates are going to have to make some serious cuts to the way it operates, which is why we are changing the way the council operates. It's not there quite yet, but we are doing it, and when that is firmed up, we'll bring that to council as well. Uh, I think that's pretty much anything. Councillor Kent, you've got a question about the, um, the PwC and the purchasing, no? Oh, okay. I thought you had something about that where we've uh, ex exceeding the regulations. Am I mistaken? The question was about the level of delegation uh, to, to, to officers. So you've raised, you, you, you've, what, what you're saying is we can ignore the current financial thresholds when it comes to officer spend. I'd like to know what the current threshold is for that. I'm not so, sure. So let, so let me go through it again, okay, cool. Madam Mayor. Recommendation 5A says, subject to recommendation 2.1, to procure and appoint advisors using the most ex expeditious and efficient procurement process, etc., uh, and that the financial thresholds in the council's contract procedure rules are waived for this purpose. I'd like to know what the current threshold is so that we know uh, just what the level of delegation we're giving is. I have to say, Council, again, that is a, a bit of a niche question, which I don't know the answer to off the top of my head, but I should get you the answer to that uh, after the meeting. Thank you, Councillor Snell. Madam Mayor, if, if I may, the, the Best Value Inspection Report was quite clear that members have taken decisions in the past when they haven't had uh, the full and complete information in front of them. It sounds very much to me as though we're being asked to make a decision when we don't have the full information in front of us. Uh, I find it difficult to ag agree to this without knowing what that figure is. It's the last opportunity now, Councillor well, Snell. I, I can... I can we refer to my previous answer, and I can get the answer to that to Councillor Kent after the meeting, or we could adjourn for several minutes, and I will get the answer and give it to Councillor Kent this evening. It's whichever. Well, shall we go for an adjournment then? Agreed. Right, I'm g hang on. Before you all get up and running, I haven't stood up yet. Uh, I'm going to say, if you could be back here by... 20 past, will that be, give you 10 minutes? Yes, 20 minutes past, thank you. Look, they're up and running. Good. Hopefully, Councillor Snell, you're now in a position to give Councillor Kent an uh, answer. Thank you. And thank you, members, for given the time, extra time tonight, to be able to do this. No, thank you, Madam Mayor. That was very valuable. I mean, it's just, sometimes, I mean, you're awash with figures and occasionally things, you know, just get, just get lost in the wash a little bit. But uh, in answer to the Council Quent's particular question, the, the current limit is £500,000. And we are asking to give the, well, we have given the officers the right to waive that temporarily in order to get the, the, the divestments over the line, basically. Um, so, you know, the, the process were ongoing. It reached the limit. We had to do something about that. So that was the reason for that. That's going to be reviewed. We, that's, all, all these decisions, all these investments, and all the extra expenses are going to be reviewed. We're going to come back in maybe late December, early January with the review so we can see where we are at that particular time, and we'll come back and report that to you. Uh, and actually, I, I was just asked about the investment advisory panel. Now, there is one next Tuesday uh, that's gone out. The one on the 28th has been rescheduled because that's the same date as the Cabinet ONS. 
So we'll get that one rescheduled and uh, we'll have that to you as quickly as we can. So I think that pretty much covers everything. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Snell. Councillor Kent, are you okay with the answers you've received? Proceed with the vote, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Uh, sorry. Do members note recommendations 2.1 to 1.2? To to 10 as outlined on pages 89 to 90 of the agenda due to the length of these recommendations I've not read these all out tonight because I'm sure you've all read them so are we noting the recommendations thank you councillors we're now going to question time on item 13 can you stop talking in the back so we can all hear because it's question time there are five questions to the leader three questions to cabinet members and committee chairs these can be found on pages 123 to 124 of the agenda I would ask those members who have not submitted questions to who have submitted, have submitted the questions to please read them out, their question, when asked to do so. Question one, this is from Councillor Kieran to the leader. Councillor Kieran, please read out your question as set out on pages 123 of the agenda. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Given the recent upholding of a stage two complaint from Thorough Nub News, does the leader feel that the Thorough Council communication strategy is fit for purpose? Leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kerrin, for your question. Our corporate communications are a vital part of how we speak with our residents, and ensuring effective council communications is very important to me. We're committed to responding in an open and a transparent way to all media inquiries. The recent complaint highlighted that the council did not reply in a timely manner as we would expect to some incoming queries being managed by the communication team. It is worth noting that it was recognised at the start of the intervention that our communication service required additional support given the serious situation the council was experiencing. The LGA has been instrumental in providing senior, le senior level communicators to help our council at this time. Under my leadership, the council communications are being improved with new processes and measures being introduced. Recent recruitment to the team has brought in fresh talent, and last week the leadership of the team was passed directly to a senior communications professional who has already been working with the council for several months to drive positive changes. On a separate note, our council's communication strategy is much wider than media relations and covers all aspects of how we share our vision and purpose. How we, inform our, how, we, how we inform about services and how we engage with the borough. Our current communication strategy is clearly in need of updating, as would be expected following the pandemic and the intervention. Work is underway on developing a modern communication strategy, and this will be delivered in, in line with the emerging corporate strategy. Thank you, Leader. Councillor Kieran. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm not sure whether... Councillor Jeffries did say whether he thinks the current uh, strategy is fit for purpose. Um, and it's interesting because he mentions the inquiries that weren't answered. And um, the, compl the original complaint was upheld on the 4th of October, by which time six inquiries had not been answered. As of, uh, as of yesterday at 3 p.m., all six inquiries got answered, and it could be complete coincidence that this question was being asked tonight, but the sceptic in me suggested it isn't. So when, uh, I, I would Councillor Jeffries be able to answer specifically his thoughts on those individual inquiries and the way they were answered, and also confirm whether the current strategy is actually fit for purpose? Thank you, Councillor Ca Leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kerrin. I'd like to say it's good leadership because, you know, I managed to get you the answers by 6 p.m. yesterday. Um, I think I did, did, did say in my answer, and I'm, I'm just reading it again here, that, you know, it was worth noting that it was recognised at the start of the intervention our communication service required additional support. So I think I have said that we did need um, additional support and that the communications team 
wasn't providing the kind of service that it should do. And I think, um, you know, since we've had the additional help provided by the LGA, the um, service has improved. Still a long way to go. We've recruited new people. We've got a new um, communications professional in charge. Um, and um, we're about to, um, uh, sorry, and work is underway on developing a modern communication strategy. Thank you, Leader. Councillor Kieran, do you want to do a yeah. second supplementary? Yes, thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you for that answer, uh, Councillor Jeffries. And you're right to comment on the, um, the, since the intervention, because obviously as recently as the 5th of October, the, um, the commissioners noted that external communications rem remain um, underdeveloped and weak. So um, what I would like to ask uh, Councillor Jeffries is, would he commit to a full review of the current strategy um, a, a review which would include journalists, councillors and members of the public so that we can finally have a strategy that is indeed completely fit for purpose. Thank you, Councillor Leader. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kerrin, for your supplementary question. I mean, we are carrying out a review at the moment. And once that review is carried out and the communication strategy is um, published, ONS are um, able to call it in and I've sat on ONS before and we've had journalists, we've had members of the public and as you well know, any councillor can turn up at a, a, an ONS and, and contribute. So for me, let's get the strategy out there, let's, let's people see it and then let's go to ONS where they can have a full um, uh, discussion and debate about it and then give us their thoughts on, on what we've done. Thank you, Leader. Um, councillor Kent. Would you like to read out your question as set out on page 123, please? There has been some work carried out on creating a new operating model for the council. Can the leader outline his thinking on this? Thank you, Councillor Kent, leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kent. The senior leadership team has been working closely with the Cabinet, Shadow Cabinet and PwC to develop a new operating model to move the organisation towards being an enabling council. Work is at an early stage and is being led by the Executive Director of Adults, Housing and Health. It is, based on many, it is based on many of the concepts that have already been shown to be successful in adults and children's services. The new operating model will include a one-council approach for transactional services and inquiries with much greater use of digital than will, that will make it easier for residents to interact with the Council for routine inquiries an integrated customer service resource management IT system that will provide a single view of, a single view of residents making inquiry handling more efficient and greater use of technology to make back office functions more, or, more aut automated and cost effective. Alongside this, the council will seek to implement a strength-based locality model devolving more power and say to communities to set priorities and say how money should be spent in their locality. It will include an expansion of the successful local area coordination model with generic community caseworkers working alongside residents, communities to develop community assets and co-design bespoke solutions with residents that meet their needs. We will also align and devolve some services to locality levels, creating integrated locality teams that work together and with residents and communities to respond more effectively the model will seek to work in partnership with communities, leveraging the resources and ingenuity of residents, community groups and partners in responding to the need of local communities rather than simply delivering pre-specified functional interventions. Our experience of working in this way in both adults and children's services has demonstrated that we can deliver better outcomes for our residents that are more cost effective through prevention and early intervention. The Council is planning a programme of engagement with members, staff, partners and residents to further develop and agree this model over the coming months. Thank you, Leader. Councillor Kent. M Madam Mayor, there is much, I think, to, to welcome in the uh, putative uh, new, new operating mo model and, and we stand ready to, to work to make sure that we drive uh, the, the, the best that we possibly can for, for residents out of it. Uh, the Leader of the Council says that he believes that it will be more cost effective. Uh, can he tell us what costings have been carried out, uh, how much uh, more cost effective it will be, and what the kind of level of investment will be needed to make sure that it works successfully? Thank you, Councillor Kent. Leader? 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kent. And uh, it's good to hear that you, you, you're prepared to work with us on this because um, we are in the process of trying to arrange a meeting between leader, deputy leaders of both opposition administration for us to sit down and actually talk about what we see as the best way forward. I think some of the detail that he's actually asking for is still to be worked upon. Um, and, I, and I look forward to working with him and his deputy um, as to um, the best way forward. Thank you, Leader. Councillor Kent, do you want a second supplementary? Thank you. Sorry, question three. This is from Councillor Kent to the Leader. Councillor, please read out your question as set out on page 123, please. Has the Leader carried out an assessment of how many redundancies will be needed to set a balanced budget for the next financial year? Thank you, Councillor. Leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Kent. The preparation of the budget proposals for 2024-25 is making good progress, and once that is concluded in full, then the Council will be able to determine whether and to what extent any redundancies will be necessary. Thank you, Leader. Councillor Kent. Madam Mayor, given that the savings target is some £75 million and the biggest single cost to the Council is that of uh, paying staff, there will be an enormous amount of staff that are concerned about their futures. Uh, what reassurance is the Leader of the Council able to give to staff? Leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Ken. I think, I think the first reassurance I'd give them is that this is not really the forum for us to be discussing potential redundancies to stoke up fear and concern amongst our, our um, hard-working staff. So as, I, as I, I'd refer him to my original answer, and that is the preparations of the budget proposals for 2024-25 is making good progress. Once they've been concluded, that's the time for us to, to have the discussion about whether or if and to what extent redundancies will be necessary. Thank you, Leader. Councillor Kent. Right. Question four. This is from Councillor Jackie Maney to the leader. Please, Councillor Maney, will you read out your question as set out on page 123 of the agenda? Thank you, Madam Mayor. News spoke recently that the former Labour-led administration in South End may have been considering a ULES style charge for the motor issues in their roads. Whatever the case, would the leader advise what legislative powers might allow a local council to impose such a tax in their area of jurisdiction? And would he also confirm categorically that under his leadership, Thurrock would never agree to such a policy here? Thank you, Councillor Maney, leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Mainly, for your question. <laughs> the ability for local authorities in England and Wales to charge road users is set out in Part 3 of the Transport Act 2000. Local authorities can only impose charges over roads for which they are the traffic authority. And I can assure you, whilst I'm leader of this council, we'll have no ULES in Thurrock and we'll have no other road charging policies introduced. Thank you. Councillor Maney, do you want to ask another question? Thank you, Leader, for that answer. It's reassuring, thank you. Um, some councils, including several in London, have also introduced emission-based parking charges. This means that owners of the kind of vehicles stung under ULES are also charged more money to park or own a parking permit. Inevitably, this means that the poorest will be stung the hardest. Will the Leader make clear the that his administration will not endorse emission-based parking charges in Thurrock. Leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor, mainly for your supplementary question. I mean, it, it, it's a, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? No way will there be charges imposed on those that can least afford it. In London, you've got you know, a Labour Mayor imposing charges on families and drivers that just can't afford it. So no, there'll be no road charges, no ULES, no, you know, it, whatever it was called, emission parking. I mean, you can't even say it. Um, no, there'll be no taxes like that whilst I'm leader of this council. Thank you, council. Thank you, leader. 
Councillor Maney, do you want a second, second, thank you, second supplementary? Uh, thank you. Question five. This again is from Councillor Jackie Maney to the leader. Thank you again, Madam Mayor. As the leader will be aware, on the 27th of September this year, a rabbit was shamefully abandoned on council land near the civic offices and found to be in a dreadfully neglected state. Given that the willful abandonment of a pet is a criminal offence, coupled with the fact that security staff believe they may know the identity of the culprit, would the leader confirm whether the incident has been reported to the police? Thank you, Councillor Maney. Leader. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Maney, for your question. Yeah, the, 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 the poor rabbit was in an awful state and abandoned in the offices. And there's no need for that. There's plenty of charities that they could go to to do that. Um, as you're well aware, um, it was in actual fact myself and the chief executive that rescued the rabbit and delivered it to you, who made sure that it got to a charity. Um, and I believe it's now in, in a lot better health. Um, be assured, if we can identify the people responsible, we will tell the police and we will tell the RSPCA. And, and I hope they are successfully prosecuted. Councillor Maney, second supplementary about the rabbit. No? Yes? yes. Go on. Thank you. Thank you. As the leader may be aware, the number of animals dumped is on the rise with a 17% increase from 2020 to 2021 and a 24% 24 increase, in 20, increase in 2022. Aside from being a welfare issue, in the case of abandoned dogs, this has a direct cost implication for councils like Thurrock. As much as I'm elected to represent the 7,500 electors of Avely and Uplands, especially the 928 who voted for me in May, I have no hesitation in making it completely clear that I consider myself a voice for animals too. Would the leader send a clear message that animal abandonment is never acceptable and commit further to ensuring that with the case in question every effort is made to ensure that the law is upheld if the culprit can indeed be identified thank you councillor leader thank you madam mayor thank you councillor mainly for your supplementary absolutely myself i 12 months ago i rescued a dog from spain that had been dumped literally you know thrown out of a car and dumped there's no excuse for that in this country, no excuse whatsoever. There's plenty of charities, Dogs Trust, RSPCA, your bunny charity, all of them, they're all there to help people. And I would urge anyone that finds themselves in some sort of difficulty, unable to care for their, their animals, to, to go to a charity and ask them for help, if not in rehoming, help in looking after them. Um, and yes, if, if anyone is found guilty of abandoning um, a, um, a, an animal, full force of the law should be thrown at them and they should be prosecuted and fined, imprisoned, whatever the, the, the penalty is. Thank you, Leader. I'll now take questions to the portfolio holders. Question one is from Councillor Kent to Councillor Ben Maney. Thank you, Councillor. Can the portfolio holders set out the amount of money spent on the now abandoned Grey's underpass scheme? Councillor Maney. I'm being clapped, I've not answered yet, thank you. Um, <laughs> Madam Mayor, um, as detailed in the Cabinet report uh, on the 11th of October and the report to the Planning, Transport and Regeneration Overview and Scrutiny Committee on the 28th of September, um, expenditure to date is £6,007,004. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councillor Kent. Madam Mayor, the, the level crossing, as everybody knows, uh, splits greys in two. Uh, the, the crossing is uh, considered dangerous. So when does the portfolio holder expect plans for uh, overcoming the issues of the level crossing to be brought forward? Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Maney. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I completely agree. Uh, the, the crossing does cut greys into, and it, it, it is a safety issue, and I think it's something that has to be addressed, and it should be at the heart of greys regeneration. There, there's a number of, um, as the report said, we're now moving on to a second phase, which is to look at a station quarter design. Uh, there's some negotiation, I think, to be had with stakeholders and some conversations to be had with CELEB, um, and, and they need to be completed before we can... Uh, consider a, a new design or a new option but what has been made clear at uh, PTR and Kavanagh is that at 
every stage whenever there's a decision to be made that will go through the full democratic process. So I wouldn't like to put a timeline on that, but um, I, do, uh, I do agree it should be an absolute priority. It is the heart, at the heart of Greys Regeneration, and I, I hope that can happen as soon as possible. As a Greys area councillor myself, with lots of residents who use Greys, um, I know it's, it's something that we need to deliver. Uh, it, it, the council is not, what is clear is that the council has taken too much of a lead on this, it's taken too much of a risk, and we can't get into that again. We have to bring Network Rail to the table on this, they have to lead, uh, but at the same time we should be pushing very forcibly for a new option. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Maney. Councillor Kent. Madam Mayor, I'm interested that the portfolio holder uh, accepts that the council has kind of overreached itself on uh, this project as it has on Stamford and Hope Railway Station and as it has on Perfleet Regeneration. Can, can I ask what his plans are for progressing the alternative development proposals for Perfleet? Thank you, Councillor Kent. Councillor Maney. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm not entirely sure how that's related to the question, but uh, uh, the original question, but you're quite right. Um, uh, Perfleet Regeneration has run into the sand and I have my, my views on that and my views on PCRL. Um, we are moving forward again. I mean, again, we're committed to perfect regeneration. It, it has to happen. Uh, and we are looking at an alternative way of, of delivering that. Um, again, there's some, you know, there's a lot, a lot to be done before we can clearly say this, this is the, the direct direction we're, we're moving in. Uh, what I think is entirely clear is that we're not going to get a spade in the ground with PCRL. Uh, we have to look at other options. Work is in progress in that regard, and I hope that we can bring forward uh, a, a more up-to-date briefing on that soon with some, some positive news. Thank you, Councillor Maney. Um, question two, it's from Councillor Kent again, but this time to Councillor George Coxshaw, please. Your question. Madam Mayor, what is the per hour cost of Thurrock Council's in-house home care service? Councillor Coxshaw. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Kent, for your question. Um, to say straightly, it is actually quite difficult to come up with a per hour, exact per hour cost for home care um, being delivered by our Caring for Thorough service, mainly because the, those co costs are fixed and attributable to other elements at times of the service, including uh, residential and extra care. And because of these variables, the calculation on the year, aim of that year hourly rate does actually vary year on year on year. Um, just as a bit of background for members, the Caring for Thorough um, provided service come, apart in 2000, come around in 2017 when three providers went bust and as the provider of last resort, um, the council stepped in. I know Roger Harris spent many a night trying to, one of the previous directors, pull that together. Um, I think the, one of the key things to remember here is obviously the demand for that home care service and staff sickness vary weekly to week on week, impacting the number of star, uh, hours delivered against those fixed costs and hence the hourly rate. Staff are sometimes often to redeployed to work in other functions of the service and are responsible and, though, and obviously that depends on spikes in demand but also they may undertake wider council duties and on that regard based on the work of a th for a thousand hours per week our best estimate is about roughly an hourly cost at the moment of £32.75. Thank you Councillor Cockshaw. Councillor Kent do you want to uh, do a supplementary question? Madam Mayor, I'm, I'm grateful for that response, and I do, under, I do understand just how difficult it is to, to, to calculate an, an accurate figure. I, I, I'm, Caring for Thurrock was uh, created as a provider of last resort. Does the portfolio holder uh, believe that it is still the best provider of last resort, or does he believe there will be a better community-based solution? Councillor Cockshaw. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Kent, for your supplementary. I think at the mo there's been a lot of good work so far done by teams at Caring for Thorough. We've got two task and finish groups, with uh, task and time um, group, uh, teams that go into homes and, and do that uh, regular care. But also we've got the two wellbeing teams as well that are doing fantastic work at the moment. They're actually training to provide some cl uh, cl uh, clinical service so that they're actually trained at the moment to provide insulin. Um, and the, the, these are very flexible and allow residents to bank their hours. There's been a lot of work, and I'm sure you would appreciate, Councillor Kent, that the market is still quite volatile, perhaps to say. It's not as structured and it's not as secure as it will be. But there has been a, a lot of work done by the Council, um, especially with the compliance brokerage team under Louise Brosnan's, to actually look at 
how we work with the market, how do we actually provide really good service, how do we support our relationships with them. Um, I'd just like to note that her work and her team's work, 80% of the providers outside that we're now starting to work with are actually good or outstanding. Um, and I think there's, we're having a conversation about the te that wellbeing team structure that um, that we've taken place already with the two of our teams, they could, the market itself is starting to respond and engage with that. I'd just like to add that the um, for the wellbeing teams, of course, there, there's a, there is a wider conversation, and I'm sure you appreciate having the inter. In, there is benefits of having a bit in-house service, and particularly when actually we're testing some of the models of actually how the how our teams want to work and how, how what we'd like to bring forward it's quite impressive that we actually some of the models that we've adapted out of social care are being looked at in the new operating model and i think it's some of the testaments of the work and the, te the testing beds that we have within our teams in the community in the community um but of course if there are any further questions more than happy to answer thank you councillor cockshaw councillor kent do you want to thank you Question three, it's from Councillor Joy Redsell to Councillor Johnson. Councillor, will you read out your question as set out on page 124 of the agenda, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Plans for the redevelopment of Blackshot's Towers include an option for the construction of King George's playing field behind Laird Avenue and Broadview Avenue. Understandably, this proposal is not being well received by some of the local residents. Would the portfolio for housing instruct his officers to seek an alternative proposal? Thank you, Councillor Redsall. Councillor Johnson, will you reply, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you for your question, Councillor Redsall. Um, please let me begin by stating first, your concerns are well understood and indeed well remembered from previous considerations of this matter. However, you will recall that the site area for the development of plans for Black Shock's redevelopment was agreed by Cabinet in March, following some very careful consideration of several options, and including in the agreed red line is the strip of land, including the sports courts to it to the west of Bevan House that you refer to in your question. My overriding concern here about seeking more options is the awful possibility of extending the life of this regeneration project and subjecting residents to living in these blocks longer than necessary. As well as enabling the provision of replacement and additional housing, this site area also enables re reprovision at a lesser height, which I know is a, also a concern of yours, Councillor Redsell. Use of this land, which of course is still remains subject to the planning process, of, you know, allows for a, a lower density scheme and is likely to be the most financially more sustainable. And it will also provide natural surveillance on the development overlooking the playing field, which will be part of the business case that Cabinet will ultimately be asked to approve. In addition, discussions are ongoing with Fields in Trust as to a replacement for this land, and wall members are to be further fully involved in this discussion. I've met with you on site last week, and I've had several conversations this week with officers and I'm also aware that after the Cabinet meeting, you have discussed with officers a range of other sites near to Black Shots as alternative housing development plots in place of the land currently containing the sports courts. And I'm led to believe that you have received a presentation explaining why these are not suitable. And I have to say, I'm afraid I have to agree with officers that the current site being considered will deliver the best business case and therefore the best outcome for residents who have had to live in these blocks for many years. So whilst I'm minded to not seek alternative provisions, looking at the current proposals with the information available today, I am, however, happy to continue to review these again with both officers and you and uh, the, the other councillors to ensure there is indeed no scope or if there is scope for alternatives. And of course, we will continue to monitor the area in case of other opportunities should arise but at this present moment in time, Councillor, I'm minded to go um, with what is being proposed and obviously let that go to the Planning Committee. Councillor Redsell, do you have a supplementary? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, of course I do. Um, <laughs> as it's my baby, I'm going to take it for all it's got. Um, 
as a local council for the area, taking another piece of green belt is not an option. Um, we should be looking at other sites, and I know you've come out with me and we've seen um, one of the sites that I put forward. Um, if, and I mean a big if, if land would be provided um, in the future, we still have not had any answers. Other residents will be affected by what is happening. We need to address everyone's worry um, and be sure that your officers are doing their level best. We've got 250 families to come, or 150 to come out of the three blocks, and they're wanting to put 240. And what they're saying is that some of the um, houses and flats will not have parking spaces. So I think highways will have a look at that because what I was told was you can park on the street. So I think they need to look at other ways of doing this because they haven't seen the streets that we've already got at the moment with cars parked and cars from people working from home. So I just um, want you to do your best because we have to work on this. People bought their houses in probably in Laird Avenue to um, look out over the field. And now I think probably highways will have something to say about it because it's just a, a small piece of land. But And giving us land in Horndon on the Hill is not a substitute. Thank you. Councillor Donson, do you wish to reply? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I certainly will ensure that officers do their utmost to make sure that this is the best business case and therefore comes as the best outcome for the residents that are there. And with the information available at the moment, I have to agree that I do believe that this is the, the, the best scenario. Um, you, as you right, quite rightly said, if there's problems with parking, highways may well have something to say about it. And as, and as I said into my original um, answer to you, this does still remain subject to the, the normal um, planning process. So, you know, as a, as a ward councillor, you're, you're more than, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You, you, you're able to stand up at planning and, and yeah. <laughs> and, and make that, you know, your, your remarks known. But in answer to your, what I think was your second question, yes, I, I will ensure that officers do continue to look at what's, what's best for this site. And as I said, I think at the moment we're on the right track to, but you know, we will do that should, if any other opportunities arise, and you will be the first to be told about it, I assure you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, reports from members representing the Council on Outside Bodies. Does any member who represents the Council on an outside body wishes to present a report this evening? No. Thank you. Item 14, Minutes of Committees. These are listed in the agenda on the contents page. Any comments? Um, item 15, motions update. This report can be found on page 125 to 130 of the agenda and is information on the status of motions. Motion 1, Councillor Redsill, do you wish to propose and then speak to your motion as printed on page 131 of the agenda? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Members resolve that a task and finish group or similar be established to look at options for tackling school parking across the borough. Further, that a report on such options should be produced at the conclusion of the group's review. Do you want yes. Okay. Right. Is this motion seconded and by whom? Councillor Polly, do you want to reserve your right to speak or do you want to speak now? I'd like to reserve my right, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Does any other member want to speak on this issue? Can I speak? No, it's finished. Can I speak, Madam Mayor? Yes. On this? Sorry, that's what that's I meant right. before when I looked at <laughs> yeah, you I didn't to speak wanna, then. I didn't want to go without being seconded, thank you. No, thank you. Um, this has been a problem waiting to happen. I'm sure many in this chamber are having trouble outside of the school gates for many schools. Catchment area is a problem now because it's become more now where people can't walk to school because there are children coming from too far away to go to the nearest school. We have 
um, children who cannot go to the local school and could walk but cannot attend because of pupils coming from further away. Yellow lines don't solve the problem, it just moves traffic further on. Um, in the new school in Splackshots, we've made sure that there is a drop-off and pick-up area in the, in the new school. And we've done that with treetops too, with the extension they've asked for. That's why the new road is going in, um, in near Stamford Road. So it's, I think it, we've, we've got to change the way we do it because we, we're, we're not solving the problem. I've got a very small school in Dean Holmes and Councillor Maney and I, we've done many things to try and stop people parking. It's a 95-year-old school this year, and it was temporary school when it was built. And it's made of wood, and it's still going strong. But the children haven't got a, car, a playground area to play in because the car parking is for the teachers only. So they've lost their playground. So all they've got is the grass area at the back. So I'm sure that it's happening in many of the schools that you... Um, as councillors, members have, to have many complaints of, and I'm sure I have, Ben and I have got quite a few schools. When the new school's done, um, I think we'll have six schools in our ward. So it um, is becoming a real problem. But thank you. I just hope that everybody will join in. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Redsall. Does anyone else wish to speak? Sorry, Councillor. Yes, Hudson. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I fully support Councillor Redsell's motion. Ever since being elected in May, I have been contacted repeatedly by residents who are having their lives made a misery because they happen to live in the vicinity of Tudor Court School in Chafford Hundred. I have seen photographic evidence and witnessed myself firsthand the situation they find themselves in. Residents report that they have to plan their entire lives around the start and the end of the school day. Driveways are blocked, pavements are parked on, and street corners, double yellow lines, and whole road entrances are parked across, often preventing my residents from entering their entire street. I have spent many hours speaking with residents, meeting with the head teacher at the school, contacting council officers, and even the portfolio holder himself to try and find a solution for my residents, but without any success so far. Therefore, I welcome this motion, and I hope that it brings about a coordinated approach and a much needed change for my residents and an end to this very long-standing issue. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Councillor. Councillor Watson, would you like to speak? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think every single councillor in this uh, chamber has exactly the same problem when it comes to the schools. Um, even to the fact that even though Council Oral did bring back yeah. a motion similar to this two years ago that it was rejected, um, I'm actually for this. However, and this is where my caveat comes in, if we're going to do a task and finish group, make it tangible with outcomes. So far, I have been here and I have asked questions around Flint Street, around West, West Southwark Academy. I've got problems down Mill Lane where I have got children that need to go to school with disabilities that they can't even get the, the bus up the road. And still there's nothing to be done. So if you want to do a task and finish group, I'm happy to support that. And I'm happy to take up more of my time after meeting after meeting that we're currently all going through, but as long as it's got tangible outcomes that is going to be good for our residents, and it's not just a talk shop. I don't expect a report to want to go to somewhere because it's saying you'll just produce a report. The report comes here with clear, firm recommendations where it's costed out and where it actually makes a difference to those children instead of my residents in London Road stopping in the middle of London Road let their children out in the street, because that's what's happening because they can't get anywhere else. So on that merit, I will give the benefit of doubt and I will agree this, but it has to be clear and cut and crystal and we do do something about it once and for all. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a quick one uh, to... I, I fully support your motion. Uh, and like Councillor Watson alluded to, uh, it's a big problem within the borough for all schools, really. And safety is a paramount thing for children, uh, letting them out on zigzag lines and they're darting into the road. Uh, so it's... Uh, but I, I believe that we've only got... And I don't know if uh, the portfolio holder could uh, uh, 
tell us that we've only got seven enforcement officers working the whole borough. So I'll, I'll take it that, you know, in, in terms of enforcement, we've got very little to spread right across the borough. So would there be any future uh, site to getting more officers to work our borough? Uh, yes, yeah, so basically, Joy, it's, it's a good motion and I'll fully support it. So thank you very much. Councillor Carter. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you for the uh, motion, Councillor Redfield. Um, I actually visited the school you mentioned quite recently in Dean Holm. It was actually my old primary school, and I know it was Councillor Cecil's as well. And it, it is an old um, building, and uh, as such, the road network is not designed around that as such. So I'd fully welcome this task and finish group to discuss the issues around there. Um, and I do welcome what Councillor Watson said. We, we've got to have a look for results. But Councillor Allen is also right here. There, there is a limited amount of enforcement officers and they can't be outside every school. So um, we, but that is exactly what should be discussed at this task and finish group. So I'm happy to support this motion today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carter. Councillor Kent. Madam Mayor, I, I too su support the motion. Uh, I, I just think we've wasted two years. It was June 2021 when Councillor Worrell brought a similar motion, although it was uh, based around three schools uh, in, in our ward where there is a particular problem. And I know every member here could stand up and bemoan the, the kind of situation they get outside schools in, in, in their wards. But residents of, of Ward Avenue in Greys uh, have to put up with utterly intolerable congestion uh, of a morning and an afternoon. Uh, they have to put up with physical fights in the street that happen almost every day. Parents taking their kids to school have to put up with ab abuse, swearing uh, between, between motorists and between residents that are unable to, to get out, out of their drives, out, out of their properties uh, for you know, three quarters of an hour, tw twice a day. It is utterly intolerable. Uh, I do wish that members had taken this more seriously uh, previously. I remember Councillor Gledhill at the time saying that he wouldn't support our motion. He appreciated that residents that lived around schools in endured uh, congestion, but the surroundings around schools could not be changed. It's not for the council, not for cabinet to work with schools to, in, to improve uh, travel plans. Uh, limited numbers of dedicated enforcement officers that couldn't be taken away from other duties to, to work on to, to, to work on schools. I'm glad that there appears to be a change of approach. Uh, I hope that something comes of this. Uh, but again, I, I think we've got two years wasted, two years that has uh, meant that a number of residents uh, live through periods of utter misery as schools uh, both start and finish. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Councillor Worrell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. As they say, what goes around comes around. So, so here we are and we finally get to, you know, maybe we'll get some real action done. Um, but what we do need to do is we need school travel plans. You know, the only way to solve this is to work with the schools for the school travel plans. You know, to, to, if they all come out at different times, you know, then it, it kind of solves some of the problem itself. Um, it is an absolute nightmare, as um, Councillor Kent has already um, pointed out on our ward. And I predicted a child would get run over, and they did. And still nothing was done. So thank you for bringing this here. I'm quite happy to go on this task and finish group. But I think that we need to involve some schools representatives on this too. Because this won't get solved with just us meeting. Don't matter how much money we throw at it. You know, if the schools don't buy into it and don't get the parents to buy into it. You know, across the country, other councils have found a solution. You know, with children even standing out with high visits saying, I go to school here, don't park. You know, there's got to be ways of shaming people so that pe people who live near schools can actually go out of their house and not be afraid to come home again. So um, I'm absolutely, thank you for this. You know, it might have took a different way of getting around there, but I absolutely welcome this motion in the chamber. 
Thank you, Councillor Worrell. Councillor Maney. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I welcome this motion. I think it's, it's uh, long overdue. I think there's a, a clear difference between Councillor Redsell's motion and the one that was debated uh, a couple of years ago, in that Councillor Redsell is uh, not being selfish about her ward and saying, pour resources into my ward. She's saying, let's take a holistic view uh, and look at options. I think with all due respect to Councillor Worrell's motion, it was very much, uh, can we have all the res resources in my ward? And it wasn't a broader look at, at the issue itself. And in relation to that particular school. There was, I believe, some, some years ago, a proposal to introduce parking restrictions uh, in that road, which would have helped, but it was rejected by residents. And I think we have to be clear when we put forward a scheme and it's rejected by residents, we can't continue to re revisit the thing. So I think there's a clear difference between what's being proposed here. It's much more, uh, it's taken a much broader approach and I think it's far more, more sensible. Councillor Watson is entirely right. We've had task and finish groups before the reports seem to be produced and go on a shelf. That can't happen, and I think that needs to be made. Whoever's on the committee, I think that needs to be made clear from the outset that there needs to be outcomes and they need to be measured. Uh, the only caveat I would make is essentially we're talking about human behaviour here, and it's like littering and all other forms of antisocial behaviour. The council can try and address it, but it's not, it's not the council that creates that problem. We're essentially responding to what other people do, so we're never, we're never going to solve the problem, but I do think it would help if we had a clear paper actually that does set out all the options because the point that, that Councillor Worrell made I think is very valid and it's one of the reasons I particularly support this and I hope it's something the task and finish group take forward. Other councils around the country have um, looked at, at different measures and I, I really hope that the committee can actually rather than just take sort of an insular thorough view look at what other councils have done. How you get there might be an issue, funding might be an issue, but until you have all those clear options to look at, I think it's, it's a difficult one to, to, to resolve. So I'm really interested in watching the committee, seeing what the committee comes up with, and I really hope we look at what other councils do um, to see whether we can, we can implement them here in Thurrock. Um, just responding to the point that Councillor Allen made, there certainly aren't seven uh, enforcement officers in, in um, the borough. One of the first things I did when I became portfolio holder was to uh, insist that we expanded that team, and we have. We've doubled it recently, and at the last count we had 20 enforcement officers, which I think is the highest amount we've ever had, and I certainly support expanding that even further, and I've given a clear direction that we should, providing you know, that, that, that is sustainable. Um, soon we'll all be voting on the local plan and I know we'll all want to support it because via the local plan we're not just delivering houses, we're delivering vital infrastructure like schools and I think it's really important that we also look at designing out this problem. Uh, Councillor Redsell uh, made a point about um, also Academy in, in Black Shots. When that was being designed, I was really sort of, there was this ongoing battle with officers who said, no, what you need to do is not have pick up and drop off zones and have absolute minimal staff parking because that way everybody will ride, will ride and walk and uh, teachers will come on ponies and we know that doesn't work. We need to be really sensible about this. And, you know, there, we, we had to fight really hard to get this pick-up and drop-off zone and even staff parking. And I think that's something we need to be realistic about here, that when we are designing new schools, we need to make sure that there are the, the pick-up and drop-off facilities there. We shouldn't subscribe to some leftist theory that if you don't have parking provision in schools, everybody will ride a bike there. That simply isn't the case, particularly when teachers are coming from, from far and wide. Uh, a last point I'd like to make is in relation to um, uh, planning enforcement. Frankly, I think, you know, there have been a number of schools that in order to expand or get their planning applications over the line have agreed to pick up and drop off zones inside their school grounds. They've got planning permission and they've probably reneged on that condition. And I don't think we've done enough to enforce that. And, you know... The main need, do you think you could sum yeah, up, I, I am, Adam, I'm coming to a close. Okay. Just a very quick point. If, hypothetically, a planning application was to come before the planning committee any time soon from a school that was looking to discharge its obligation for a pick-up and drop-off zone, having got its planning permission, I trust that they will uh, robustly say no to that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Maney. Councillor Polly, would you like to speak now? Uh, I, I do believe that every ward in the borough is affected by this issue. Um, young 
going parking at school gates within our borough um, demands attention. We, we all agree on that. Um, the safety and well-being of our children should always be their priority. And the situation around our school gates is where improvements are required. The, there's a culture change in in the schools now. We've got academies, we've got free schools. We're not in the situation that we were before, whereas as the local education authority, we we could set a policy uh, and uh, and have that communications and linking with the, the schools in the same way. I absolutely agree that stakeholder involvement in this task and finish group is paramount. Um, other programmes such as the school street programmes uh, advocates that and, and examples of that means that, you know, we need the school councils buy-in, we need the, the teachers buy-in um, and, and it needs to, to really represent um, and take on board some, some of the policies that the schools themselves are, are uh, implementing such as the um, non-sibling uh, affiliation in some areas where, where it means families are having to travel further uh, for their schools. We do absolutely need more innovative ways and I, I know some schools now, as, as Council Worrell said about the, the children with the high visits, they actually have the little um, like stand-up um, like, like a traffic cone outside, but like, make it look like a child so that uh, with messages. Um, I, we Certainly at Summers Heath, I know, within Bellis, you, things have got escalated. They've got two entrances. So it's not only um, the, the parents that are having altercations and that. You, if you've got staff members from the school actually trying to marshal this in the morning, they're being subject to uh, abusive behaviour, threatening behaviour. Um, we, we had a situation with um, staff vacancies for crossing patrol people, couldn't recruit people for that position because in many situations, the, 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 those lollipop lady, men and ladies are, are actually um, in, the, in the throes of altercations on most, most days. And uh, I, I think it, that that is, as, as Councillor Money um, suggested, you, you know that that is about human behaviour. And all, although the count, the public seem to think that council are responsible for everything, it, it, we we're not. And so within this task force, as well as the the schools and the um, multi stakeholders, I'd like to see some PTAs uh, on that task force as well, so that um, we, you know, we can all get buy-in. And I think we're, we're all in the same position as well. Um, I visited Dilks, for example, spoke to their school council. They were actually suggesting a, a possibility of a one-way system in front of their school that would alleviate. Sometimes, like, the children are offering us the solution. So, um, whereas... Councillor, could you sum up, please? You're out of time. Sorry, apologies. Uh, uh, so, I, I think we also, just very briefly, need to take into consideration some of these schools have the muggers with the community use agreements. So, the... the the length of the school day has been extended quite considerably. So I, I think any traditional enforcement yellow lines is outdated and we definitely need this to, to take a refresh and approach to that. So um, I will be supporting the motion, obviously. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Polly. Councillor Redsell, do you want to sum up now? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Main has stolen a bit of my thunder, but you know, I'll forgive him, you know, as I normally do. Um, just I hope everyone in the chamber supports the task group, because I think it, it's, if we have everybody's input into it, it's going to get somewhere. Um, a lot of schools I know, they name and shame. Um, on their newsletters, they put the number plate of the person that's causing the problems, so I think that works in some schools. Um, as Councillor Mainy said, um, we've had schools who 
because they want the classrooms, they put in the conditions for parking in the back of the school and then renege on, on the condition. And we've got one school that's got um, enforcement on it at the moment. Um, and it's not, it, it's not the right way to be. Um, not sort of bringing up black shots, but we, it's worked in the new school and treetops where we're going to, in the end, close Buxton Road off of King Edward Drive. So it means that people in those, that little tiny road will be able to get out to hospital appointments and there'll only be children going in by bike. So it's, it does work. When you put in that at planning, it's got to be at the beginning. You know, we've got to have that drive in, drive out. Um, option. Um, I don't. We've got to sign up to something that achieves something. If it doesn't, then it's it's no good. So I want this task force to to really hammer home what we do. As Councillor Polly said, yellow lines just move traffic on. They don't do any good anymore. You know, they were good years ago, but they just move it on. You know, you know, by the convent and places like that, it, it's just a nightmare you know, people trying to get out. So I just want to thank you for your input tonight and hope we get somewhere. Thank you. Thank you. So are we all in agreement of Councillor Redsaw's um, motion? Thank you. Thank you, Councillors. Uh, motion two. This is on page... Um, this is item six. Councillor Howden, do you wish to propose and then speak to your motion as printed on page 133 of the agenda? Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. Uh, Madam Mayor, it gives me a great pleasure to move this motion this evening to confer on the Reverend Canon Darren Barlow, Freedom of the Borough. Awarding Freedom of the Borough is rightly a very rare honour. I think it's something that's only been done three times during my 13 and a half years in the chamber and it's very fitting that for Darren he becomes the fourth. Um, the ch contract he has with the Church of England may have provided a basic foundation for what Darren's service was meant to be in the borough but I actually think that his life in the borough is a testament to the fact that he has morphed and changed and contorted himself to engage with any number of obligations and institutions in any way that he felt that the community needed him. Uh, Darren first joined our borough as the team rector of the Grays Thurrock Ministry in 2006. Within five years, he was asked by the Bishop of Chelmsford to take on an additional role as Area Dean of Thurrock. That meant he took on the leadership role for all the clergy and CV churches in Thurrock, which number 23. Later, he added the title of priest in charge of Chadwell St Mary. That takes his litany of personal titles to Rector of Greys, Reverend Canon, priest in charge, Merrill Chaplain. The only title he's not taken on in these years is the title councillor, even though I dare say he has probably attended more council meetings than some elected members. Um, perhaps he decided that attempting to arrange divine intervention was an easier gig than being sat in this place with us. Um, I first got to know Darren when I became chairman of the Children's Services Committee. He had served as the Church of England representative on the committee for about six years. Our first few meetings were not particularly positive between the two of us. He thought that I spoke at tremendous length. It did not improve. And it did improve, to be fair. Um, my length didn't shorten, Darren's patience increased. Um, and he, ma he made a tremendous contribution. I'm given to believe that over the last 17 years he has attended or presided over 250 local funerals, over 100 baptisms, uh, a tremendous amount of weddings, and given the fact that he physically sits in the chamber every month to deliver uh, prayers, he has successfully, despite being a man who wears a dog collar, um, worn a tie in the chamber more frequently than Councillor Duffin or Councillor Spillman combined. <laughs> of course, we both, we best know Darren as the chaplain to the mayor, a duty he first took on in 2010 for Anne Chill and has since served Yash Gupta, Tony Fish, Steve Lydiard, Sue Gray, Tunja Jotola, Barbara Rice, Terry Piccolo, Sue Shinnick, myself and now you, Madam Mayor. Um, Madam Mayor, there, there is a, a particular story I would like to uh, share regarding something that uh, Darren did uh, that means a tremendous amount to me personally. 
when I became mayor, or sh very shortly before I did, I decided that as we approached uh, Pride in 2022, I wanted to make it a more prominent event than it had been in the past, obviously uh, reflecting the fact that I was the first gay mayor. I decided I didn't want the Pride flag being hoisted up the very ugly municipal flagpoles in front of what is now a disused council building. I wanted it to be uh, in front of the far more aesthetically pleasing historic C of E church. I wanted to use um, the uh, church's flagpole. I sat for about 30 minutes making a few mental notes for myself about how I would argue my case with Darren. I think I got about three or four words in before he interrupted me and he made that offer. To see uh, a flag that is nothing but symbolism being hoisted above a church that represents tremendous social cohesion, it was a moment that meant a great deal to me, meant a great deal to the wider community, and for me is a perfect example of how entirely effortlessly Darren found himself as an open resource for whoever was stood in front of him and for whatever they needed. Madam Mayor, the Church of England is often said to have three core beliefs, scripture, reason and traditions. He certainly knows his scripture, he has offered tremendous reason to a grateful borough and he has defended tradition with poise and dignity for a great number of very, very fortunate mayors. Madam Mayor, I'm very proud to move the motion. Thank you, Councillor Howden. Is the motion seconded? Councillor Coxall, would you like to speak on now? Thank you. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And I partly should say thank you to Councillor Howden for bringing this motion into the Council, but the real thank you really needs to go to uh, Reverend Barlow for your years and years of service to the borough. Um, I can just about maybe remember some council meetings in 2010, um, many, many years before I was elected, um, and that part of your role with the council and your, your role as the mayor's chaplain was the cornerstone of, you have been at the, at the cornerstone of civic life for so many years, um, and it is really should be an honour of this council to thank you for your service. I can't imagine, and that's the same for me, I can't imagine a council without you, Darren, at all, um, for your work. And I, I think Councillor Howden has put it into very eloquently in his long style of speeches. Um, but I think I should just end it with, thank you ever so much for your service, and it should be an honour for this council to confer you on as freedom of the borough. Councillor Redsell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I agree with it. Um, with the motion, um, Reverend Barlow, I met in 2006, and um, it isn't all about religion, it's about caring. And when I was mayor in 2006, I lost my hubby in 2007, and um, Reverend Barlow was kind, you know, and um, really kind to me. And I just wanted to thank him for all his service. I'm getting a bit, oh, sorry, um, I wasn't going to go down that route, but um, he, I think he embeds in in what caring in society means. You know, it doesn't matter, just someone needs someone to talk to sometimes and he makes that position in life. He goes out of his way to talk. So thank you, Darren, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Redsall. Councillor Kieran. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, thank you, Councillor Howden, for bringing this motion. It's um, a pleasure to be stood in back in 100% because we've all been grateful for Darren Barlow's wise words and counsel for our council over the years. He always seeks to bring us together. Um, he, he always finds the right words for the right moment. And if you think of all the different things that have happened in our borough and nationally in the time that he's been here with us, and he always seems to find a way to help bridge divides. He's also an outstanding pastor at the heart of my own ward of Grays Riverside. And I know that when he does um, leave, many of my local residents will be very sad to see him go. It's, um, it's true, as Councillor Howden has said, that he has served as mayor's chaplain. But in reality, he's not just been the mayor's chaplain. He's been Thorrock's chaplain. And we've all been grateful for that. I wish him well on his retirement. 
he will be missed immensely and I fully support his deserved elevation to the status of free man and I look forward to when we can you know if uh, look forward to when this can be done formally and with a proper celebration so thank you thank you councillor Kieran uh, councillor Kent yeah, Madam, Madam Mayor, I too will be uh, supporting this, this, this motion, of, of course. The one thing I would say is, is that the process of appointing somebody to the freedom of the borough is uh, an odd one in that we agree this here, specially convened to uh, actually bestow the freedom of the borough. So I, I'm, I'm not going to say too much now. I'll, I'll save that for, for that occasion. The one thing I will say is that Darren has served here since 2006. Uh, but Freedom of the Borough isn't a long service medal. You have to do something to show that you have served the borough with distinction in that time. And I think that Darren has done that in spades and will be genuinely well deserving uh, of, of, the, of this, of this honour. Uh, I'll say no more, Madam Mayor, because there will be another occasion where we can do it uh, with more time. Thank you, Councillor Kent. Councillor Piccolo. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, I mean, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, Darren for the, 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 the advice and help he gave me um, when I was serving my very fortunate second term as mayor. My uh, original uh, chaplain was uh, John Guest, my local vicar. But I've known Darren for a, a number of years prior to being a councillor um, when I worked in the voluntary sector. Um, and always, always respected his, <coughs> his calm and logical behaviour and reaction to things and also the good advice that he's given on many times. Um, but uh, I won't go on for that, but thanks very much, Sam. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Worrell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think that you're going to be one of those hard acts to follow. I can't imagine who, you know, who that person could be that could fill the boots um, of, of Darren Barlow. Um, it's, it's the way that he's um, led the, the prayers in, in this chamber. And um, also in his little statements, I think he's told many of us off um, for our behaviour in this chamber. So I think that um, he's... He has tried to guide us as best that he can um, in the chamber and across the road in the church. Um, and we can't, and it doesn't, it's not just in this chamber that, you know, I'll remember him. You know, the work that he did during COVID, mm. you know, um, he was, you know, always there for everybody, <coughs> you know, making sure that the church was a safe place for people to visit. Um, I sure miss going to Christmas services, you know, different things, bumping into him in greys as he's off you know doing his shopping you know may and when last year when we all got to plant our tree and he very kindly offered to run across the road and water our one every day for us so that it didn't die so you know we have got something lasting in the, in the um, memorial park so um yeah i shall miss you being here um you know it will be a new chapter for us but um yeah as i say you know you're going to be a bit of a hard act to follow Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mrs. Mayor. Uh, I fully support the motion, of course. And uh, rather than have my back turned to is it the Reverend, uh, Reverend, uh, thank you for the service to the borough. Uh, you've been an exceptional, exceptional uh, representative of the church. Okay, and uh, I wish you. Uh, the Reverend Karen, uh, Canon Darren Barlow, a wonderful retirement. I hope you enjoy it. And can I request that the whole chamber stand and show our thanks with perhaps a standing ovation and a round of applause for Darren, please. Could we do that? At the end, yes. No. But at the Thank minute, so no, because we all want Thank to you. God, speak. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Allen. Um, sorry, you threw me there. Councillor Polly. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. And um, as, as expressed by other members, sorry, Darren, but yeah, we, we all 
We know you personally as well. You, you've held your, your, your office in good order and you've always approached with dignity, with the respect and um, that it deserves. And sometimes you have had to deliver some very difficult messages, even your one tonight. Um, Councillor Helder mentioned about the gay pride flag. I'm also very moved that um, when we're remembering Serbinica and the atrocities that happened there, again, it, we, we're looking at an Anglican church flying a flag for um, genocide, which is, is just typical of how inclusive and um, how, how you are as a person and, and how when you look at the improvements that have happened into the church, it's much more warm, friendly places. That took a lot of hard work and a lot of effort and sleepless nights. Um, but when, whenever you go into St Peter's and St Paul's now, there is always a welcome. Um, we've enjoyed many a cup of tea at various services there. Um, it's, it's, it's not the cold, austere place that that it was once, and, and a lot of that um, is... I know you've got a team behind you, Darren, but you, you was the driver, uh, without question, you was the driver that, that delivered that. Um, on a personal note, I, I know you've been an absolute rock to some personal friends of mine, and we know who they are. Um, and, and you've seen many of us at uh, various stages through personal... Um, tests and challenges um, and you've always done it with a calm persona and a reassurance um, and I don't and you still look as young as I remember you the first day I saw you and how you've managed that I, I have no idea um, but I can only echo all, all the thanks um, that have been already spoken to you in this chamber and absolutely deserved thank you Thank you, Councillor Polly. Councillor Chuckle. Oh, thanks, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, I've known Reverend Darren for a while, and um, he's been my priest in Charles and Mary, and um, I've sat in his services, and I like his way of delivery, the way he preaches. is quite uh, exceptional. And um, Darren, we're going to miss you, and um, thank you for what you've done. You are so, you are very nice, very humble, very dedicated in discharging your duties. I wish you all the best. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Howden, will you sum up now, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think uh, just to point out with Councillor Kerry, and I, perhaps I used the wrong wording, uh, obviously uh, Reverend Barlow is retiring from the borough, but he is off to um, uh, a, another posting, and we wish him certainly uh, well with that. Um, I enjoyed uh, Councillor Piccolo's reference to the fact that Darren served as his mayoral chaplain in his second term, uh, probably an indication that most mayors should get to do more than one term. Um, and um, just to um, highlight how entirely selfless Darren is trying to be, even on his way out, he is giving up his space on the William Palmer Trust in order to make sure his successor doesn't feel awkward about him choosing to stay when the appointment is naturally now theirs. However, he has chosen, I understand, Madam Mayor, to continue to serve as your mayoral chaplain for the, yes, the, for the rest of the year. So even at a time where he should be fully entitled to just focus on his life now elsewhere and new endeavours, he is making sure that his exit is as graceful and as useful to other people as possible, which I think uh, thoroughly sums up the man. I think we have broad consensus, so I look forward to the uh, Freedom of the Borough now being uh, formally produced for him to be presented at a later date. And I'm very grateful for colleagues contributing so forcefully. Thank you, Councillor Howden. So, is this a motion agreed? agreed. Thank you, Chamber. Thank you. And as you say, this will be bestowed on Darren at a later date, and so we'll all be speaking about him with much joy. 
Thank you. Um, this concludes the business of the meeting this evening, and I now declare the meeting closed. But before you all go, please can I remember members to take all your rubbish home with you and use your bins near the exit of the chamber. And also, I'd really like you all to come along this evening and uh, partake of refreshments in the Merrill Chamber. Thank you. We need a round of applause, Madam Mayor. That is true. I forgot that.